Well, Jai Guru. <laughs> Love and greetings from all of the nuns that I think, I hope you've already felt. Did anyone here do their homework from last year? <laughs> <laughs> I did too. <laughs> well, more of that later. <laughs> Our subject is spiritualizing family life. And really, each one of you has already begun to spiritualize your family's life by connecting your family with Guruji's worldwide spiritual family. The goal of all human life is one, it's to return to God. It's not only monks and nuns that will realize God through these teachings and householders make a little spiritual progress. If we think that, which many of us do from time to time, we're forgetting what a soul is. Each soul is the child of God, a spark of God, a spark temporarily separated from the source, but able and in fact destined to reunite consciously with spirit. And if we have a teaching such as the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, there's only really one question, when? And then the answer is that each one of us has free will. So the when is up to us. It can be sooner or it can be put, up, put off for a while. Each soul returns to God by the same pathway Master spoke about the spinal highway. And each one, householder or monastic, has the same spinal centers. We have just as many spinal centers as Diamata, don't we? <laughs> I mean, sometimes it seems like she has one extra one and <laughs> she's given up the three lower ones. <laughs> but really, we have the same potential. So to think any other way is to deny yourself and then to minimize others. Lahiri Mahashaya was not less a master, an avatar, because he was a householder. And Sri Yukteswarji was both householder and monastic at different times of his life. Master primarily gave the example as a monastic. And in SRF, there will always be, through the centuries, householders and monastics who find God through these teachings. Master said, if you follow the Self-Realization Fellowship teachings I have brought to you from the Masters of India, you can find God in this life. This I declare unto you. If you follow the teachings, you can find God in this life. And Babaji told Lahiri Mahashaya, the highest yogic attainments are not barred to the family man, family woman. He went on to explain that from Lahiri Mahashaya's balanced life, men and women will understand that liberation is dependent on inner rather than outer renunciations. To spiritualize family life or any way of life, we simply need to put more of God into it. And we all know the way. We could always tell someone else. Sometimes we fail to do it ourselves, but uh, we all know meditation must be there must be regular. Develop and anchor your whole life in your personal relationship with God and Guru. And then live the teachings, live Master's ideals as in the lessons throughout his writings to the best of your ability. And if you do that, the only other thing you really have to remember is never to give up. 
And we all know he said a saint is a sinner who didn't give up. To make conscious spiritual progress, we must meditate regularly. Nothing else so much gives you the feeling that you're in God's presence, Guru's presence, and that they care about you and that they will help you. Because God is the goal of all human life, family life should be spiritual. It should be a foundation for the soul's spiritual progress in that incarnation, as well as being a place and time for the nurturing of the body and the mind. And it will be more so as the world evolves, as we go into higher ages. But for us, it can and should be now. Every individual family group has different karma, different challenges. And we, just a small handful of monastics, we will always pray for you, but we can't solve all of the problems for you. But it's our responsibility, and it's our joy too, to share these liberating teachings. And they will help you to learn how to be the conqueror yourself, the conqueror of that aspect of delusion which still clouds your vision of truth, your vision of God. Guruji gave this guidance, which we should apply always. He said, when a problem thwarts you, when you find no solution and no one to help you, go into meditation. Meditate until you find the solution. It will come. He said, I've tested this hundreds of times, and I know the focusing power of attention. It never fails. It is the secret of success. As a mortal being, you are limited. But as a child of God, you are unlimited. Connect your concentration with God. One devotee, actually he lived in Australia, was a father of two. His wife was not a member, but she was tolerant of the teachings and his wish to meditate. He had only received Hong So, but already had feeling that he had never really deeply meditated and he wanted to make a special effort. So with his wife's agreement, he took a Sunday and he planned to meditate all that day and it was mostly Hong So because that was all he had, Hong So and prayer. And he told us there was no spectacular experience, but he became very, very peaceful. And he continued for 10 hours, and at the end, he went out into the living room. And he was still feeling inside very, very deep peace, deep calmness, stillness. And his children, were out there in the living room and they were doing one of the few things that always caused him to lose patience and become angry. And he told us he hated hearing himself shout, you know, a yogi shouting, a spiritual father who can control only by shouting. He didn't like that in himself. But he didn't have to respond that way this time. He calmly corrected them. See, that, was, that peace was so deep. While he was sitting in meditation, he was thinking, well, I'm very peaceful, I know I want God, but nothing spectacular has happened. But that peace had permeated his being, his consciousness. He went out, he was able to calmly correct them without losing that peace of meditation. And then when he wrote to us, he said, he then understood the power of long and deep meditation. It changes us. And then we can cope with the circumstances if we have to. Remember Sister Gyanamata said when she was facing something that she would really have preferred to avoid, she said she was able to pray, change no circumstance of my life, change me. And that is what deep meditation does. And then the whole world seems better. 
we know from the lessons that peace is the first proof of God's presence. And how to hold on to the peace that that man gained from his long meditation. Master says, keep the attention always at the Christ Center, even in activity. He was asked once, is there a scientific method apart from Kriya that will lead the devotee to God? And he said, yes. A sure and swift way to the infinite is to keep one's attention at the Christ Consciousness Center between the eyebrows. It helps us to be a little detached from everything of this world if you really keep your attention there so that we can always react as we should to others and be the right kind of example to our loved ones. One person living that way can spiritualize a whole family. Just as Martha said, one moon casts more light than all the stars. That devotee's wife was at least sympathetic about his wish to give a whole day to meditation. Some have far more difficult circumstances. After talking to one young woman, I felt that nothing could be much more difficult than her circumstances. She lived in a trailer and she had young children and every evening when she wanted to meditate, there was just the one living room. The husband and the children had the television blaring and she had nowhere to go to be in seclusion. And also her husband was anti-SRF. He resented her going into meditation and not being with them. But she no doubt prayed. She came up with what served her as a solution in those very difficult circumstances. She would go into the little bathroom, run a tub of water. The whole family thought she was weary. She was having a long soak in the tub. They couldn't bear the idea that she was meditating, but they could bear the idea that she was a little weary at the end of the day and had to have a soak in the bath for about an hour. So she... <laughs> This is how she meditated. She sat on the bath mat. And that's how she fulfilled her spiritual routine. She really is one of those who, I feel, taught me that there always is a way if we're determined. We know that every true religion of East and West has an essential moral foundation for spiritual development. We have the Ten Commandments, in India the Yamas, the Niyamas, the Golden Rule. Every path has an aspect of moral teaching as the foundation. I think Jesus talked about a house that is built on a rock, being able to withstand the storms, but build one on the sand and it can't. Those who live by moral concepts have a clear conscience, and with a clear conscience, you can face God in meditation. And that moral preparation helps us with restlessness, helps us to be able to sit still in the proper posture for deep meditation. And then we have the marvelous techniques, as Master said, that he brought from India the techniques of pranayama, or control of the life force in the body, pratyahara, to interiorize the mind and the consciousness. And then, when the awareness of the body recedes, we reach a state of deep interiorization and concentration. And when that interiorized concentration is directed to God, that is true meditation. Everyone, a householder, monk or nun, has to go back through that spinal highway. Once we're established in moral living, and we'll make a regular effort to learn this control of the life force, interiorization of the mind, when we're willing to use the techniques he's given us until we learn to do that properly, then, Master said once, if you really control the life force, 
if you really interiorize the consciousness, the last three steps of concentration, meditation, and samadhi, or the experience of God, can go very, very quickly because you're already withdrawn, you're already there. You put that interiorized concentration on God and it can go very quickly into the state of union or some beautiful experience of God. This is why the techniques are so essential. They're a most incredible gift that we've been given. But the foundation before all the techniques of yoga is right or moral behavior. I think so much of the alarm at the so-called breakdown of family life today is because, well, usually, perhaps both parents have to work and there is less time for moral and spiritual training. Sometimes we neglect this side of life, especially the life of children that we're responsible for. And then we're shocked when perhaps as teenagers they get into trouble. Really, moral and spiritual training is a lifelong process. And if parents have the right understanding and begin early and gently, by the time the child is old enough to make his or her own decisions, there is a lifetime of examples of how to think, how to act, and how to treat others. My own mother was a very charitable individual. I was a very small child during World War II and the period after World War II when there was quite severe food rationing in England. There was never, everything was rationed. There was never anything extra. I don't think we ever went fully without a meal, but everyone ate very modestly. Most people were slim and most children who were growing more quickly were thin. Everything was rationed except anything you could grow in your own garden. We had an apple tree that had extremely delicious apples and when they were ripe we would get together, my brothers, my mother and I, and we would pick the apples. And she always set aside the very, very best ones, the most perfect, the most delicious, for a neighbor with very severe arthritis. She couldn't walk. Just occasionally her husband would carry her to the car and take her for a little drive. And we agreed with this sort of in principle, but she always took all of the very best ones. <laughs> and a lot. <laughs> and we were very human, we couldn't help thinking it was going to be a lot less for us. <laughs> and um, I can remember sometimes we would say to her, do they all have to go to Mrs. Mrs. Williams? But my mother had a way of ignoring comments like that. If your attitude wasn't right, she just didn't hear you. <laughs> all I can say is it worked for us, I don't know if it works for you. She truly turned a deaf ear to that kind of thing. She would simply go on with what was right. And uh, I can remember during the picking, apple picking process, sometimes I would eat really more than I wanted right then because it was so delicious. They were sun ripe and they had like a perfume and aroma. And the thought of all the very best ones being given away was just a little much for me. <laughs> but uh, my mother was very clever, I see now. She always sent me to deliver the apples. And this lady would come to the door in her wheelchair. So I would be at the door and taking the fruit into the house and I would always say it came from my mother. <laughs> I don't know, it must have, must have influenced her mind. She always thanked me as though it came from me. And, you know, right now, all these years afterwards, I couldn't tell you, I wouldn't know if I ate one of those same apples. I've forgotten what they taste like. But I remember this lady had a lovely face and a most radiant smile. And I remember the effect that smile had on me. 
And I would walk home and I was kind of warmed by her gratitude, her sweetness, but also very, very aware that I didn't totally deserve it. You see, my mother knew what she was doing and she didn't let a world war interfere with that or food rationing or really anything else. Master talks about the divine role of both mother and father. He said, the mother's love is not given to us to spoil us with indulgence, but to soften our hearts that we in turn may soften others with kindness and free struggling souls from the hard knots of bondage to the world. Those who are helplessly shackled by sin and dire difficulties need our tenderness and our love. He said, my sincere and complete devotion to my earthly mother was the first cause of my love for the Divine Mother. Thus it was my great love for my mother that led to my illumination. And of the father he said, a father should remember he is not just a human parent, but a representative of the Heavenly Father. As an instrument of the Divine Being, the Father plays his greatest creative role when he implants in his children thoughts that will lead to self-realization. And Master gave this further guidance for family life. Meditate together every morning and especially at night. Have a little family altar where both husband and wife and children gather to offer deep devotion unto God and unite their souls forever in ever joyous cosmic consciousness. The more you meditate together, the deeper your love for one another will grow. If your spouse and other family members are on this path, then you are blessed and your home can be run by Guruji's ideals. But if you think you're completely alone, or if at some time of your life you find yourself completely alone, without even other members living nearby, one direct disciple said, you can always have a meditation group of seven. Jesus Christ, <laughs> Bhagavan Krishna, <laughs> Mahavata Babaji, Lahiri Mashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Paramahansa Yogananda. They are omnipresent. That is a quality of Christ consciousness, cosmic consciousness. As we feel a touch on any part of the body, even when our eyes are closed, they are aware of everything in creation. That means they're always within reach. When we speak their names, they hear us. And when we call them, they are instantly with us. Lesser yogis may have to move by the speed of light, but they are with us instantly. Don't you think they were with the young woman I mentioned who was meditating in the bathroom of her trailer? I bet there was a group of seven meditating there, honoring her sincerity. So if we so choose and we invoke them with sincerity and reverence, we never need be alone in meditation or in activity. We have free will, the choice is ours. We see the fruits of this kind of living in our beloved Diamata the freedom and joy that fills her life, and the compassion that she has for all. In the ashram family, we pray before taking food, and probably many of you do too. We also pray regularly at several other times, and I thought I would tell you about that because you might want to incorporate some of these ideas in your family life. We pray before meetings. 
Sometimes we pray during meetings. <laughs> That's kind of another subject, isn't it? <laughs> we pray before beginning work each day. We always pray before some new undertaking is started. We pray when anyone goes on a trip. If we go out, even just for a very short errand, we have a prayer before we leave. And speaking from the experience of years of living that way, it gives you a sense of protection. And then remember to say thank you afterwards. We need to teach our young people to pray for others. The SRF Prayer Council, to me, is one of the greatest forces for good on earth. It always has room for more members, and there's no age limit, high or low. Prayer is so empowering. If this is, if this is a situation you can't do anything about, someone you would like to help but can't, you don't have the means, whatever it is, you can pray, and then you see how things improve. Scientists are always discovering new sources of outer power, outer wealth. But perhaps the greatest untapped resource on earth is the power of sincere prayer. One young man was uh, in a road accident. He broke a collarbone and had it set and uh, thought it was on the way to recovery. But instead of becoming less painful, it became progressively more painful. Finally, he had to go back to the doctor, and x-rays were taken. And the doctors said, told him very sadly, they said it appeared that where the pieces of the bone should have knitted together, there should have been growth of bone, and then it stops automatically when it is restored to normal. The growth continued. They said all they could think was that those pieces of bone that had been broken had become cancerous. They were continuing to grow and they were pushing his whole arm and so on out of alignment. So they said there had to be major surgery, take out most of the collarbone, put in some sort of substitute. And his name was given to the prayer council. So he went in for surgery and his wife told me afterwards after 15 minutes, they sent him to recovery. They, it took him many hours to come out because they had anesthetized him for an operation of several hours. But when they opened over the bone, it looked so different to the way it had looked on the x-rays. It looked absolutely normal. That they felt there was, they had no explanation. They closed the incision and he recovered and 20 years later, he still plays squash, a mean game of squash. <laughs> so, this is a kind of thing you just never know. If you would add your prayers, you never know what good might be able to be wrought. It's very, very important to give children a sense of a God who loves them unconditionally and eternally, who listens to them and who will help them. Master said, each soul's relationship with God is unique in the universe. But we have to get them started, don't we? After the youth program this year, one girl wrote, this was in a letter addressed to Master, without you, I would be lost in this world. I think she said it for all of us, didn't she? God is love unconditional, and we should never give a sense of a condemning judge. One devotee told me that her mother's strongest weapon of discipline was to say, if you don't stop that, or if you do that again, God won't love you. And she said to, God, to her, God became someone to be avoided at all costs. He was apparently a killjoy. <laughs> 
such a pity. In Master's family, we want to encourage children to go to God, to pray for the help that they need, and to pray for others. And then the fruits of even a child's prayer can be along the lines of something told me recently by one of our members. As a single mother, she had two children, not much money for luxuries. They lived in a rented apartment. There was a little house nearby that went up for sale, and one of her daughters just fell in love with that house. And she would go down and look at it every day after school and tell Master how much she wanted that house. If only they could have that, they would have a garden, they could keep pets and so on. But the house was too expensive for them, the house sold. And the girl continued after school every day to go down and look at that house and tell Master, we need that house. <laughs> and then one day, Master appeared to her in a dream. And he said, you expect me to get you that house. <laughs> he said, you need to cooperate more. <laughs> and the two things he mentioned, and they probably sound familiar to most of us, help more around the house and have a better attitude. <laughs> the child told the mother about her dream. And she tried very, very hard to do what Master had said she must do. The original sale fell through. The house was on the market again. The owner lowered the price, but it was still too high for them. And the house was sold again, not to them. And the child was crushed because she really believed Master would get it for them. And her mother, probably having a test of faith herself too, <laughs> told the child, this could be a test of your faith. And the child continued to visit the house. And even more important, she continued to tell Master how very much they needed that house. <laughs> and she tried to be very, very, very good. Her mother said she was almost perfect by this point. <laughs> <laughs> the second sale fell through. The owner by this time was very frustrated, brought the price down again for a quick sale. And then the agent said to the mother, this house was meant to be yours. And now they have that house. And because of that mother's guidance, that child will know, you see, for the rest of her life, prayers are answered. It is okay to ask for what you need. She has been given or she has been led into the guru-disciple relationship. And notice that her mother didn't say, do Hong Saw for 10 hours first. <laughs> you know, that's not the way. That was right for the adult who got that idea, wanted to do that. He wanted to do that, that was his choice. Something like that can't be imposed from outside. We have to remember that God gave each one free will. It has to be the soul's desire to deeply, deeply seek God. We should always encourage, but never compel them. Or they end up rebelling against God as well as the parents. And of course we have the right to insist upon right behavior. Because we have a responsibility to teach youngsters how to live at peace in this world. And if, if we don't, then it becomes, as Sri Yukteswarji said, when that young man left his ashram, no longer receptive to his training, he said the cruel world must be his teacher. The cruel world must be his guru. Another beautiful example of spiritual training, a father who was again a single parent took his young son to a rest home. He wanted him to learn to reach out to the elderly. And there was one old gentleman there, alone in a wheelchair, and not really looking as though he was part of, it, of everything, not sort of connected with his surroundings. And the father encouraged the child to go and speak to that man. And as the boy did so, the old man reached out and took his hands 
and then he raised one hand and touched the boy's face because apparently he didn't see very well and he was trying to feel the boy's face with his fingers. And then he took the boy's hands again and lifted them to up and kissed the child's hands. It meant that much to him that a child would come up to him and speak to him. And you wonder how long it was since that old man had been treated as anything but a patient. A spiritual home is like a mini ashram where we're taught to give love and respect to all. And if we receive that training early, then we won't find the inevitable training of the world as harsh. In Sephirization magazine recently, this guidance was given for helping all all relationships and for keeping one's consciousness always in the higher centers. It was to always express these qualities. Love, unselfishness, forgiveness, understanding, endurance, loyalty, faith, and kindness. If we live that, our consciousness remains in the higher centers. And we are correspondingly, the magazine said, we are correspondingly spiritualized. This is how life on earth should be lived, so that it can be happy and fulfilling for everybody and lead to everyone's freedom in God. Master doesn't blame us if we can't do these things perfectly, but he does expect us never to give up trying. After all, didn't an avatar come back for us. Master said that as a result of Sri Yukteswaj's training, he always kept his priorities straight. He said, I never miss three things, meditation, morning and evening, my exercises and service to others. He said, these I religiously perform. All else I somehow manage. And we know he did it all with a sense of humor because he also wanted us to remember that ultimately this is a dream. This is a prayer I thought Master would like. Some of you may have heard it before, so forgive me if you have, but it's called a prayer for the day. I I think it could also be called a prayer for family life or life in this world. Dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been grumpy or nasty or selfish. But in a few moments, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed. (laughs) And then I'm going to need a lot of help. (laughs) Never doubt that these teachings, if lived faithfully, will transform your life and the lives of all of your loved ones. Babaji said even a little practice saves us from dire fears. When I was... um, First in the ashram, it was my first year or two, I was serving, answering the telephone calls. I was at the switchboard on a Sunday morning, all alone, everyone else was in a service. And an elderly lady called. She sounded very frail, but she was very strong spiritually. She said she had cancer and had been sent home from hospital. They told her her condition was incurable. They said, When you can't even keep liquids down, come back to us and we'll make you comfortable till the end. 
She said she was alone in the world. She had no living relatives. But she had reached that point medically. She had no self-pity. She just wanted to know that the prayer council was praying for her. She hadn't been able to eat anything solid for some time, and now she couldn't keep liquids down, so she knew it was just a few days. She had called the ambulance. It was on its way. She told me all her, all her things were in order, her will, leaving whatever she had to Master's work, to help his spiritual family. She also knew Master's promise that if we are faithful to the end, he or one of the gurus will be there to usher us into heavenly realms. She said, the last thing was to call you. She said, I just need to know that you, dear ones, are praying. She said, I know Master will be with me. I just need to know that you, dear ones, are praying. By the time the call ended, she was as calm and peaceful and centered as she had been at the beginning when I needed several Kleenexes. <laughs> and her courage, I hope I never forget her example, sublime courage. But also think what these teachings had done for her as everything outward was taken away. Family, her youth, her health, finally even the capability of living in this world. She replaced all of those losses with more and more of God and Guru. And don't you think that avatars escorted her into paradise? See, it can be the same for each one of us. The choice is ours. It is always our choice. Because Master said, God's blessing is always there. He said, His blessing is always there. Ours is sometimes absent. It's very helpful to practice the presence in activity. Talk things over with God and Guru. But try not to do it the way I did once. I was walking on the grounds at Mount Washington and I was sort of obsessing about something. And to give you an example of how important that was, I can't even remember what the subject was. But <laughs> you know where the Temple of Leaves is? And then there's a meditation nook over to that side. The pathway comes through from the Cactus Garden to the tennis court. And I was walking in that section deeply involved about something, talking inwardly to Master. I wasn't really aware of my surroundings. Just as I got to that point, I just heard myself say out loud, Master, you'll just have to take care of it. Well, <laughs> at that moment, two heads jerked up in the meditation nook. <laughs> just imagine you're sitting there, somebody talking to a minister. You ha suddenly hear someone directly address Master. You have to look, don't you, just in case. <laughs> but I'm afraid all they saw was one nun <laughs> putting her head down. <laughs> At first I was a little embarrassed. I kept on walking, of course. And then my sense of humor kicked in, and I was thinking what would happen as I walked by and I imagined the member turning to the minister, the eyebrows go up, you know, maybe the eyes get larger. I thought, well, what could the minister say? And I thought, well, perhaps he said, well, some of us are a little eccentric, but we, sh <laughs> but we sure talk to Master a lot. <laughs> so it's very important. <laughs> talk to Master, but not necessarily out loud in public. <laughs> And the fact that I can't remember what it was, doesn't that indicate really how important it was in the scheme of things? It was so important that day. But I think it also indicates he probably took care of it, otherwise it would be a continuing worry to me. And isn't that how he always responds to us? So why do we worry? We know the formula. Pray, do your best, give the results to God and Guru. Be prepared to hang in just a little bit longer than is comfortable.
to me, this, this week of convocation, doesn't it almost give glimpses of Hiraniloka, the higher life of advanced Kriya yogis, the sharing, the selflessness, the way each one's presence and spiritual effort helps to uplift everyone in the group and contribute toward each one's greater awareness of God. Isn't this too an example of spiritualizing family life? And when we part at the end of this week, let it not be with sadness, but with increased spiritual strength and increased joy, because we're all Master's pioneers We're all called to help change this world. By our prayers, by our example, by the support and encouragement we give to others. In other words, by what we are, even more than by what we say. I love these words of Master. To me, they epitomize the expanding concept of family. You can apply them to a personal family or to the worldwide family of SRF or the total family of humankind. And they show how love within a small family unit can lead us to liberation. He said, none I behold as stranger. I rejoice to love all with a God-given pure feeling of human attachment. I care not how many holy men howl, be attached to no one. I am attached to all. To love all with genuine attachment as one's own is beautiful, enjoyable, heart-thrilling, heart-awakening. It is he, the cosmic lover, as the cosmic trickster who comes to us garbed in the forms of those we love, father, mother, child, beloved, friend, acquaintance, in teaching us to give love through parental, conjugal, and friendly attachments, the cosmic lover surreptitiously imbibes from us in those forms the attachment-fragrant love of our hearts even as he gives attachment-perfumed love to us in his guise of parent, child, beloved, and friend. See, every time we've ever loved, it's been God that we loved. He goes on, let us not be afraid to love our dear ones, foolishly fearing to lose them in the mists of death. Love them so dearly, so truly, so purely and forever unlamentingly, even in temporary love-kindling separation, that you find in them the everlasting true love of God. Last year, I may have been a little audacious, I assigned some homework. That homework was to look in the mirror once a day and to say to the person you see in the mirror, an avatar came back for you. And this was based, of course, on Master's beautiful poem, God's Boatman, wherein he promises that if it would be necessary, he would come back a trillion times. Many, many of you in the last year have told me that you've been using this homework assignment and they found it helpful. So for all who wish, shall we continue with that for another year? (laughs) Thank you. And we could add, earlier I quoted from the lessons where Martha said, if you do something for others with no thought of gaining anything yourself in return, you have momentarily stepped into Christ consciousness. So perhaps, if you wish, Let's try to have at least one action every day that would fit that category. Something we do for others with no thought 
of any benefit, any gain to ourselves, just given for the love of God. And that way, let us have several thousand more moments every day where souls at least briefly enter Christ consciousness. Jai Guru.